Welcome back to another episode of Blu-ray Boutique. I am your co-host, Rosalie Lewis. And I'm your other co-host, Tim Rosenberger. And on this week's episode, we're talking Silent Sherlock, meaning we're going to be talking about four different Silent Sherlock Holmes films, many of which were actually considered lost at one point and thankfully have been rediscovered and re-released. Um, so this is a topic that was suggested by Tim. And I'm curious, Tim, before we get into the silent versions, do you have a favorite Sherlock Holmes on screen? It almost has to be, for me, it has to be Jeremy Brett, then followed by probably Van der Kammerbach and then Basil Rathbone. All right. So you have a much more well-rounded view of Sherlock um, in the movies than I do, because I would say while I found the Robert Downey Jr. version somewhat entertaining, um, I certainly don't think it's the most faithful adaptation. So... My pick for on screen is Benedict Cumberbatch. I have not seen the Basil Rathbone versions. <gasps> um, I know. Mm. I actually almost tried to watch one before this, but we were already watching four movies in mm. a time. I know. Mm. Well, it could be a future topic. Oh, I don't think they're about to. Uh, well, maybe. I'll have to look at my. They might be all slightly qualified. We'll have to look at it. So I'm clearly missing out because you were making sad sounds during that. Have you watched the Brett show at all? I have not. Oh, God. Oh, okay. I've been a fan of the Sherlock books for years, and particularly the audiobooks are what I fell in love with first. I remember getting them from the library and listening to The Hound of the Baskervilles on my way to and from college in the car because I had a long commute, and it was so entertaining, and I was hooked for life. So I really devoured as much Sherlock Holmes as I could get from then on in terms of the books. But... Yeah, in terms of screen adaptations, I guess I am, uh, I've got some education to do. But how about you? When did you first get hooked on Sherlock Holmes? Um, I forget exactly what age. I think, um, because I was introduced to him, I mean, I knew who he was and stuff, but I think I first got into the character was, was watching one of the Rathbone ones. I don't, it might have been his version of The Hound, but it also might have been the second one he did, which was called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. It was one or the other. I know The Hound was a very early one that I'd watched of his. But it was one of... I kind of got... I watched a few of his films because my stepdad had them on VHS and we... uh, My mom showed them to me. And then um, I think it was... I think it was after that, unless I'm getting my time thing mixed up, that I started wanting to read some of the books and I saw a complete version at Burns & Noble that looked a lot like one that I saw from school that I really liked because it had like a picture in the back of... like a of Sherlock Holmes' lodgings, quote unquote, which I really loved. Nice. Um, and I asked my mom if I could if I could get that, and it was like sixty dollars or something. And she said, "Well, I'm not going to say no to buying your book." So she got that for me, and I still have that. And I read, you know, some of those here and there. I still haven't read all of Sherlock Holmes. I've read all of the canon, but I've read quite a few. Um, and then I got more into the finished the Baz Rathbone stuff. Eventually, got into the Jeremy Brett stuff, and you know, I've been kind of a lover of that uh, ever since. So. Had you seen any of the Silent Sherlock's before, or was this your first time? I thought I had seen the third one we're going to talk about, which is called just called Sherlock Holmes, uh, from 1922. Because I know uh, I thought I'd watch it with my stepdad, but I think what would happen is we started watching it, or he turned to it, and it was on TCM or something, and then he must have turned away because I, watching it, I figured out I remembered almost nothing except for the beginning of it, or part of the beginning of it. Um, but I had watched the uh, the last one we're going to talk about, uh, the, the German uh, German version of Hound of the Baskervilles. I had watched that, oh, about a year or two ago when the whoever did this, Flickr Alley, released, yeah. released it. I watched that one. But the rest of them I hadn't. I've been wanting to watch m- most of them for quite some time, but I hadn't watched any of them. But yeah, you hadn't watched, I think, any of them, had you? No, I had not. So this was a fun activity. I really enjoyed the excuse to dive in. So we're going to be talking about, you know, four of these silent ones. And the only thing I'm sad about with this is that we can't talk about an actor who, to me, is to what to, to, is to the silent era what Baz Rathbone was to class to Golden Age Hollywood, what Jeremy Brett was to tele, to at least 80s and 90s television, and what Benedict Cumberbatch is to now. Uh, it was an actor called Ely, Nor- Ely Norwood who did, oh God, I think like 40 or so uh Sherlock adaptions of the original stories he did some of the stories I think and possibly all the novels um not all the stories have been written yet when he was doing them um and he didn't do all of them they just stopped before Doyle was done writing all of them sadly I think a lot of them have been lost um none of them uh you can find some of them on YouTube and I know TCM has released some of them 
as, as shown some of them and stuff. And uh, according to somebody from Flickr Alley, there might be a chance of somebody restoring them in the UK. So we might see some of them at some point. But in my opinion, he's kind of the Sherlock Holmes of the silent era. So I'm sad we can't talk about him. But at some point, hopefully we can... Hopefully at some point, some of his films, or all the ones that are available, uh, best case option, will be released and we can talk about them then. So the first movie that we're talking about, it's a German version from 1914, based on a play that Richard Oswald mounted in 1907, and he also adapted this version, his his play version, for the screen um, and starred in it. So this is the one that was released by Flickr Alley, um, and it apparently, again, was lost at one time, but it has now been restored, so very happy about that. And this one is directed by Rudolf Meinert. I'm not entirely certain I'm pronouncing that correctly, but hopefully so. And I misspoke. He, uh, Richard Osborne does not play Sherlock Holmes in this. Uh, he actually just wrote it, but he also will go on to direct one of the other ones that we're talking about. So the person that plays Sherlock in this movie is a person whose name I will hopefully not mispronounce. And <laughs> I'm already concerned that I may. So um, his name is Alwyn Noyce. I believe that's the correct pronunciation. I don't speak German. Um, so this is an adaptation of The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's called Der Hund von Baskerville. And it is a really entertaining version, but it has very little to do with the book. If you're familiar with the story of The a Hound of the Baskervilles, there is a dog in this movie, um, and Sherlock Holmes is in this movie, but it's very different from the, the story that I remembered, but I definitely still enjoyed watching it. Uh, what were your initial thoughts? Um, well, it is difficult for me to know where to begin to describe how much I hated the movie. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I really uh, disliked it. Part of it is what you just said, that it really has almost nothing to do with the novel that it is based on. Um, it is actually kind of appropriate that actually in the opening titles, they actually don't refer to Doyle at all. They don't say based off the novel or whatever. They just say based on the play by so-and-so. In this version of the story, they have a young man, Henry Baskerville. Uh, his father recently died through some uh, mysterious circumstances, and he's gone back to his home in Dartmoor, I think it is, and uh, to look over the estate and blah, 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 blah. Falls in love with somebody but there's this legend of this mysterious ghostly hound that has haunted the Baskervilles for generations that might be out to get him, which is all well and good, part of the Baskerville, original Baskerville story, but uh, they take a lot of different directions. They basically just use that as the kind of germ of the idea, and they go off into these very other, these different things, which I'm sure we'll get into as we talk more. Part of that, too, is they reveal the who the whodunits behind this, because obviously there isn't... Mr. If you know Sherlock Holmes, uh, supernatural stuff is usually explained logically. So there is a person behind the strange goings on here. And in the story, and in most adaptions, they reveal that near the end of the story. Um, but in this one, they reveal, I think it's like within the first like 13 minutes of the movie, they reveal the whodunit, which I find... So basically, there's no mystery to it, is uh, I guess another issue I have with it. Yeah, I was puzzled by that as well i was like okay where's the suspense coming from if you're going to reveal the whodunit right away and it's pretty obvious watching it even even if they didn't straight up tell you it's this person it's basically the one that is in most cases would have been a red herring because it's like the most obvious possible one just because of the way this person behaves on screen their mannerisms their look you know, yeah. everything about this person is suspicious. So well, yeah, I mean, they have the kind of like the silent movie, a bad guy makeup where he's very obviously the bad guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the world's biggest mutton chops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like all of these guys had bad hair, but um, in any case, I think I liked it much more than you'd because oh, you hated it. <laughs> I gave it three stars on letterbox and I found that there were quite a few people who did not go that high, but I, here's what I loved about it, okay? It's it's not a Sherlock movie, in my opinion. It's no. just 
a weird, <laughs> wonky, like, adventure story from 1914. And if you can get past the Sherlock part, because they don't even... They don't introduce your life for a little no, while. And, no, uh, I, I was starting to. I honestly, because even in the title of it, I don't remember in the title card if it even says Sherlock Holmes, Hound of the Baskerville. I think it just said, you know, Durhound von Baskerville. I was, I, I mean, first just jokingly, but then after a short while, I'm like, are they, is Sherlock not even going to be in this? Right. I had that same question. I'm like, where is he? Why isn't he on screen? So it takes a long time for him to show like up. Like halfway <laughs> through, yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, we do get some things that I enjoyed. So, first of all, let's talk about the actual hound. He is, like, the world's friendliest-looking dog. I... Sure, he's a giant great cane, but he's got this <laughs> giant long tongue, and he's, like, spotted and running around. Um, he's going to refer to the house cow. He's going he's gonna, he's gonna to lick you to death is what he's going to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. He's not intimidating in the slightest. No. Um, so, that kind of destroys the illusion, but he's cute. I also enjoyed the fact that Sherlock has this like light bright bat signal that he uses to something Watson <laughs> up this little elevator. Okay, so wait, let's explain the scene. So when they finally introduce Sherlock, again like thirty something minutes, I because I looked at it because I was really curious. It was like thirty something minutes into the movie of this hour five minute movie or whatever. You know, they introduce him at at uh, at uh, Baker Street, which is not two twenty one B Baker Street. It's no, like, it's, it's eight, eight Baker eight, Street, which, which I was is, like not correct which is almost it's not quite as it's actually a little bit better than apparently there's some other version maybe another german version which has their addresses 221a baker street which is very oh, weird he knows it's 221b <laughs> yeah but anyway it's very weird but anyway so they've introduced him there he's doing whatever he's reading a book or doing chemistry or whatever the heck and uh he, no he's reading the paper because well we'll get to yeah, why he's, he's reading we'll, the we'll paper get... in his pipe and he's in a bathrobe. Basically, if you read something in the paper that makes him think, oh, I need to go to Baskerville Hall. And so he just types out or does something. Well, yeah, basically a light bright spells out, Watson, come here. And Watson, who I thought was in another room, which I guess he technically is, goes up an elevator, which I guess they have in their little humble abode. And this and this guy who looks like basically Sigmund Freud or something goes up yeah. to this elevator and he talks to Sherlock for two seconds, then he's never seen again. It was, fa- it was, it was just. I was laughing out loud. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was very. <laughs> it was so ridiculous, but like a lot of stuff in this movie, I caught myself just going. I said what so many times during this movie, like wh- what? What are you doing? This is not okay, correct. Well, I have in my notes twenty seconds, McGruber, which is reference to something that happens later in the movie where I was laughing even more because. In this movie, Sherlock Holmes doesn't use his like clever wit. Oh, not at just all. Just the gun. <laughs> oh, that that he line. Everything. Oh, so the uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a scene when he first introduced goes to Baskerville Hall. Uh, okay, what's what's well, let's backtrack for a second here. Sure. So uh, the guy, the, the the person who's who done it, and what he's I'm about to describe also made me think. There's another reason why I thought Sherlock Holmes proper wouldn't show up in the movie. The the villain decides to dis- to disguise himself as Sherlock Holmes because Henry Baskerville was like, oh, I should write a letter to Sherlock Holmes and he can investigate what's going on, blah, blah. The bad guy destroys that letter and he's like, okay, I'll pretend to be Sherlock Holmes and I'll solve the mystery, quote unquote, and whatever. Um, so he shows up and they fall for it, blah, blah, blah. And then that's why Sherlock Holmes goes to Baskerville Hall because he, th- because he reads in the paper that Sherlock Holmes is a Baskerville Hall and he knows that's not right. But anyway, so he goes there and the fake Sherlock Holmes has, has, has rigged a bomb in like a chandelier of the basketball hall in just the opposite room of where ba- where Henry and his love interest are in. And so he, ba- uh, Sherlock, I think, climbs up the the wall or something or go uh, into the room. He sees the bomb and he says something along, and, you know, he tells like, oh, Henry, well, there's a bomb here, blah, blah, blah. And instead of just like disarming, he says, uh, he, he said, first he says, the, the castle will explode in 20 seconds, which is... Yes, uh, that's where I wrote down, 20 <laughs> seconds, McGruber. And it's so... And then he... Sh- for some reason, the best idea is to shoot at the bomb. And right, that seems safe. And it's just, and it works. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Oh, my God. It's, and then he uses the fuse to light his cigarette. Oh, God. Yeah, it's so... It's so ridiculous. And then he it's throws so it out. Yeah, tough. then they throw it out the window, and then it explodes. And it still explodes. There's actually several explosions in this movie because the bad guy, in stopping the letter from going to the real Sherlock, literally blows up the mailbox 
to keep the letter but you couldn't just steal the letter i don't know well it's one of those things where it's hard to you can't really get your hand into it i think is the reason for that but i'm more like did the henry basker or not was he not aware that the mailbox exploded therefore he has to write his letter again i don't know right I don't um know. but oh okay there's so many ridiculous things because the movie is i think i would just like the movie if even if i hadn't read any sherlock stuff because i just don't think it's a very good movie ignoring the deviations it's doing from the canon and the, the novel specifically that it's quote unquote adapting but i think even especially as a sherlock holmes fan i'm annoyed by it but some people might enjoy it because there are certainly pulp aspects to it you know with maybe some of the disguises and then at one point um you know the bad guy is looking at sherlock holmes through you know these little like this i think this piece of armor he's looking through the eye holes and then there's a yeah, trap like door that. there's a trap door and sherlock is stuck in this little tunnel thing and all this stuff and there's like a little cool the tunnel was really cool it kind of looks like scary but also fun like like as if it's he's going down like a luge almost yeah um so i did really like the design of that yeah and there are and um you know shock at one point is trapped in this little chair that's kind of almost trapping him almost james bondish and stuff so there is some of that stuff i just kind of wish for me personally it i if the movie itself was better and if it was if it was just another character that was not Sherlock Holmes, I would enjoy that stuff more. But it was just it's that it's so far removed from what Sherlock Holmes is. Yeah, this really had more of a feeling of like early James Bond slash like almost like the 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 Adam West Batman just with the, all the weird explosions and yeah. weird stuff. I mean, it's very comic. It's much more comic than I was expecting. Um, there is some some cinematography that I like. There's an early scene with the bad guy out on the moor with oh. the hound. Mm-hmm. That's really beautiful. Yeah, because they do some nice, almost um, oh, I almost shadow play like stuff with it, where you see right. his silhouette and stuff. And that I do agree that was that was really well done. That stuff. I wish we had more stuff like that. Uh, but that's I think another issue I have with the movie is that there was really no mood with it. There was no attempt really to make it scary. Again, it's more of an adventure pulpy thing. And there's no... I mean, because a story like this really has to be kind of gothic-y. And it has to be... I mean, if any Sherlock Holmes story is horror-based, except, well, I guess this and maybe Sussex Vampire. I mean, it has to really be this one. And right. there, there is none. I mean, they don't really attempt... I mean, they start with, you know, the mis, you know the, the, the legend of the hound and stuff. But then you see the hound and he's just going... Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. And then they go... And it's just not scary at all. So, I mean, that's just... I mean, those... If they had more shots like that, more moody stuff like that, I think it would be uh, better. But those stuff... That kind of stuff is few and far between, I think. Um, well, I'm glad that it wasn't lost to history. I enjoyed it a, deal, a, a certain amount. But it sounds like, you know, we're a little bit divided on that. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts are going to be on the other ones. But one thing we should mention before we uh, conclude this one is, strangely enough, there are actually uh, five sequels to this movie. There is a... Well, one of them, I don't know, I guess is a it's a short that was done the very next year, 1915. Um, I don't have the direct uh, type, uh, translation from it from German, but my, I think it's something like Legend of the Hound of the Basket Road or something. Um, and I don't know quite what the story is on that one. Uh, then the third one, which is something like The House of Frank... Oh, Baskerville, whatever, where it says Sherlock Holmes' arch enemy, blah, 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 has escaped a, a watery death from the 1914 Hound of the Baskervilles and returns to torment Lord Henry and his fiance. And the fourth one, Lord Henry's tyrannical ancestor is seen to murder his wife and his faithful dog. The dog later returns to haunt his something master involving Sherlock Holmes, blah, blah, blah. So basically they kept this going somehow for, for five movies. <laughs> Uh, uh, wow. They have a sequel to a novel that never had any sequels whatsoever, so it's it's very strange. I don't know if those movies still exist anymore in any form. They would be interesting to uh, um, to watch. I know the guy who plays Sherlock in this ver- uh, version plays him in the first few, and I know the guy who wrote this version, who directs the later version we're going to talk about later, uh, I think directed some of the sequels and stuff.
Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is uh, just called, it's a movie just called Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's from 1916. Um, it is based off a very famous uh, play adaption um, from uh, written by a man named William Gillette, who also stars as Sherlock. He did uh, many performances of this play. They say around 1,300 performances, or maybe over 1,300 performances. He did it first from 1899 to 1901, 19, then he did it in 1905, 1906, 1910, 1915, 1923, and then for a while between 1929 and 1932. I mean, by the time he was done with it, he was, like, I think in his mid to late 70s. He's around, I think, 63 or so when he did this movie. But anyway, it's an adaption of the play, and I think a pretty accurate one from the play. And I talked earlier about uh, Ely Norwood, you know, being the Sherlock, in my opinion, the Sherlock of the silent era. Um, uh, And William Gillette is really the Sherlock of the stage. I don't think anybody even now has really topped him in terms of popularity and in terms of if you're Sherlock Holmes... If you're a big Sherlock Holmes fan, in terms of kind of uh, awareness and stuff, he really is the Sherlock of the stage. And he brought to uh, popularity a lot of the stuff we associate with the character. He brought the uh, Deerstalker to more prominence. Not that it wasn't, that's in the is in the original, original Sidney Padgett drawings and stuff, but he brought that to more popularity. He brought po- to popularity the Meerschaum pipe. Um, which I've heard he, which is usually it's a it's a pipe with a big bowl on it, um, which I've heard that he picked for the stage because it would allow him to basically turn his head to his side, put the pipe on his shoulder, and then do monologues without having to take the pipe out. But yeah, so it's a lot of stuff he he popularized that were rather not in the stories or not in the stories very prominently. The the play and then the movie um, they're taking bits and pieces from different Doyle stories. One of the prominent ones is Scandal in Bohemia. And before I get into that, I will say. Up until the Basil Rathbone, Hound of the Baskervilles, really all of the Sherlock Holmes adaptions were set in what were then modern times with no real effort to put them into any sort of period Victorian setting, except for possibly this one. You see a lot of horse and buggies and stuff, and as somebody else pointed out, during this would have been obviously during World War One, they would have had more stuff to worry about in Bohemia than this sort of scandal. But anyway, so basically the plot of this one, and again, it takes bits and pieces from different stories. A woman who is associated with, uh, I think a prince or something uh, in Bohemia, she has died under not good circumstances, and her sister uh, thinks the prince, again, I think prince is to blame for that, and she has some damning evidence that could really hurt him and the family, and could cause a scandal. And when she's telling somebody this, um, some criminals in the other room of this, I think hotel or something, have overheard this, and they basically come up with a ruse to capture her. And uh, Sherlock Holmes gets involved with the case of trying to get her out of out of that dangerous situation and to figure out where she's hid this damning evidence. And it turns out at one point, eventually it's revealed that uh, Moriarty is behind these criminals, is kind of pulling a lot of the strains. And the leading lady of this, uh, she is a she's called Alice uh, Faulkner. A play by an actress, I think it did, maybe I think only this movie, Marjorie Kay. And she's basically, um, if people know the stories, is basically kind of inspired by uh, Irene Adler. And again, Raylan Jett plays Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and then an actor called Edward Fielding plays Dr. Watson, who I think he gets a bit more screen time. And an actor named Ernest, Ernest, and I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Mar Payne? Something like that. Uh, he plays Moriarty. Sounds like a good guess to me. He plays Moriarty. So uh, something I liked about this one, off the bat, is that you do one. Obviously, since they're based off of more, even though again it's not based off directly off of any stories, it is obviously that Gillette, Gillette is taking a bit more respect with the original Doral stories. So it feels a lot more Sherlock Holmesy in terms of setting and tone and stuff like that. But uh, right off the bat, we do get more. One Sherlock Holmes appears like almost right away. But also, um, we do get to see, not a lot, but we do get to see a little bit more of his deductive reasoning and more of his uh, method, which I think uh, was really nice. Yeah, I appreciated that we got to see Sherlock a little bit sooner in this one, absolutely. And the fact that it just seemed to be more in the spirit of the Sherlock Holmes that I know and love. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was also, of course, happy about Watson showing up. I noticed that this had like a, almost like a serial nature to it, and reading about it, it seems like it was shown kind of in parts. Well, uh, um, yes and no. Okay. The, okay. So the thing that we probably should, I should have mentioned up front is that this one, like Rosalie said at the beginning, uh, all of I think really all of these were considered lost at one point. 
Some of them still have bits missing, which we'll get into for some of the other ones. This one, I think, is t entirely intact. Um, it was discovered... I th uh, almost, it's, it was almost 100 years old at that point, and it was le released in 2015, so the 99th anniversary of when the film came out. I think the entire film is there, but they had to use a French cut of it, which serialized it. The original cut of the movie, I think, was just a movie with no intermissions or breaks in it or whatever, but the French cut of it, they showed it, I think, maybe a few years later. It might have even been the 20s by the time they showed it. They broke it up into pieces and they serialized it, which is the version you will see um, uh, from Flickr Alley, who did all but, who did this uh, release as well. And um, I do want to thank Flickr Alley for sending me a screener copy of this. So yes, yes and no. The version that you can see is serialized. It originally was not. I kind of enjoyed that it was serialized, to be honest, because it's sort of helped me kind of keep my footing throughout. Sometimes, even in the previous one, I would kind of lose track of what was going on just because a lot of it was like people talking and then intertitles and then people talking and then intertitles. So it's sometimes easy to get a little bit lost in that. So this one, I thought did a good job of kind of foreshadowing, okay, this is what's happening. This is what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a little bit easier as a viewer to follow this story. I also think it helps that the story like has a coherent plot. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the signifiers I really enjoyed in this, I think, first of all, the setting was better in terms of this, mm -hmm. you know, there was like ornate furniture and the buildings looked more sophisticated. It didn't have the somewhat cheap appearance of the previous one. Mm -hmm. And Sherlock is a much better dresser in this movie, which <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> He just seems like he kind of has his shit together a little bit more. <laughs> and then I also enjoyed that he plays the violin at one point because that's, mm -hmm. of course, something that all Sherlock fans probably know about him is that Sherlock likes to play the violin. So I enjoyed mm -hmm. that we got to see that just a bit and we got to see some of his his little tricks that he would play on mm -hmm. the villain and I enjoyed that too. It's especially useful because I think, yeah, the plot for this is coherent. I do think a problem with probably the first three of these, and I don't think so much for the last one, is that they kind of overcomplicate uh, the plots for them i think sometimes like doyle well 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 while well, well, he would sometimes maybe oversimplify things to a certain degree um they kind of he gives you kind of as much complications as you want i think some of these just add a bit a bit too many bits of plot uh kind of subplots and stuff to them and they make it more needlessly complicated than than uh they need to one thing I will say, though, and I was a little bit surprised because I think this is the longest of all of them, mm -hmm. is that this one felt the most suspenseful. Even though there were a few parts that dragged mm -hmm. a bit, it felt, I felt like a real sense of danger and there's violence in it. I mean, the butler basically almost gets strangled at one point. There's a gas chamber involved. Like, there's a lot of pretty dark elements and I feel like it really upped the suspense level from especially the previous one but even in comparison to some of the later ones in my opinion mm -hmm. this one really did a great job of balancing the suspense with that you know, no. kind of playful nature no yeah they definitely do do that and um i felt i don't know if you felt the same way but i felt there was certainly i mean again obviously based off a famous play that Gillette had done many times by this point um and i think it probably honed and stuff which may be one reason why this feels particularly good i felt while watching this that it felt very much, and in a good way, it felt very much kind of like a play, which I liked, because obviously for all of us, unless you're very, 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 very old, you know, this is going to be our only ch chance to see uh, this famous play. So, I don't know, it almost felt like in certain points that I was actually just watching a play, and it was very transported, transport whatever the word is, it transported me back a bit, and I found that very kind of interesting and uh, stimulating. Yeah, I agree. I think actually the performances in this were for sure next level from the previous and maybe even some of the others. Uh, I think especially when you look at the relationship between Holmes and Moriarty in particular, Moriarty in this, the villain is, you know, we all know that that's Holmes' nemesis, right? He's mm -hmm. very legendary. And so it's important to get him right. And he really does come across as like this evil mastermind. He doesn't come across as a stumbling idiot like you know you, you've seen portrayed in other movies in this he really does seem like truly intimidating you're kind of worried for Holmes's life even though we know he's gonna somehow figure it out and I think those times when you see them head to head in the same room 
you can it feels like a battle of wits it doesn't mm-hmm. just feel like you know might versus right so yeah. i enjoyed that aspect as well i think they played off of each other very very well yeah i mean i don't think he's the most accurate of moriarty's but i think he's 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 accurate enough and he is appropriate to this sherlock holmes which i think is really important and i think all the actors be, i mean william jupp was obviously from the planet i think all the rest of the uh, actors in this were also taken from the stage show as well so i mean again I, uh, so all these people would have had a lot of times to work on these at least parts and stuff, and I think you can see that in the movie. But how do we feel about William Gillette as Sherlock Holmes? Do you think he makes a good uh, Sherlock Holmes? I do. I do. I mean, he's older than all the other ones that we see, right? As mm-hmm. you mentioned, because he's been playing him for at that point like nearly twenty years. But he's he's a really good Sherlock. He's very distinguished. You can see that he's a bright person. The only thing that threw me a little bit was the romance. Oh, yeah. Because I'm not used to seeing Sherlock really care about that. But it, it was handled pretty tastefully, I thought. So I didn't mind it. It was just surprising. I feel like um, part of the problem with adapting the Scandal Bohemia is there isn't a lot of mystery to that, except for where is this scandalous evidence and stuff. Did you feel like there was enough with uh, there was enough of a mystery aspect to this movie? Or is it more just kind of Sherlock Holmes adventuring? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was more about Sherlock outwitting Moriarty. The mystery itself, I I mostly wanted to know what's in those letters, right? (laughs) I was very curious, and we never really know. But it's just a plot device, really, to get the story going. So I guess it doesn't matter, ultimately. I was fine with that. I I would like a little bit more mystery, because, I mean, one of the main reasons why I love Sherlock Holmes is because it's about solving mysteries. But I don't mind a character-based one, too. So this was a good, like, setting the stage for who the character is Mm -hmm. version. So for our third Sherlock Holmes, this one came out in 1922 and stars a very well-known actor that you've probably heard the name of before, John Barrymore. Mm-hmm. The John Barrymore stars as Sherlock in this movie, and his clever Dr. John Watson is played by Roland Young. This is also the screen debut of William Powell and Roland Young. Um, it was directed by Albert Parker. So this version... Um, is very similar in nature to the previous one we just finished talking about. It's a, it's a remake of it. It's, actually, it's, it's also adapting yep. the play. Yep, it's adapting the play. But we get a little bit more detail, and it's also a younger version of Sherlock Holmes. So, mm-hmm. you know, some of the, the plot differences. First of all, we meet Sherlock when he's still a student, which I thought was interesting. So basically, Sherlock and Watson are both students in university at the time. And when we first meet Sherlock, he's literally sitting under a tree writing in a notebook. And he's, it's hilarious to me because he's like such a stereotypical, like, I don't know, I picture like a guy who's a philosophy major in college and he thinks he's writing all these deep thoughts down. (laughs) That's pretty much what Holmes is doing. Um, And he's writing like his strengths and weaknesses and like writing down things like what is love. And then, of course, he meets a young woman just at that very time when, when he like, falls over. So that? it's it's very fun. I enjoyed that. And then, you know, he has an early encounter with Moriarty, comes away unscathed, but basically decides, like, he has a mission. He's going to stop Moriarty. And years later, he gets an opportunity to potentially do that. So, again, it involves blackmail. It involves letters. Um, it involves a young woman whose sister has died this time of suicide. And actually, there's somebody famous playing one of the Larrabees. The Larrabees are the, the couple that are like swindlers, basically, that are keeping Alice Faulkner from going public with the letters. And so this is actually played by Hedda Hopper, who, as you may recognize from the name, was very influential in the Hollywood blacklist. She was definitely a well-known name in Hollywood later on in her life. But in this case, she plays one of the bad guys, let's say, right? She's one of the Larrabees, and they're no good. They hang out with Moriarty, and they're working with him. So very similar story, uh, much more fleshed out. Like I said, this one is 109 minutes, I want to say. And there is, I believe, some lost footage, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, so this one is 85 minutes long. I think, I don't remember how long the original version is, but I think it's closer to the length of the last one we talked about, two hours. Um, so this one was also, again, lost for a long time. I think it was rediscovered in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And basically they had basically a jumbled of, of footage, which wasn't, I don't think it was, it wasn't just that the footage was out of order. I think they also had alternate takes and stuff. And right. blah, blah blah, and luckily the director of the time, who directed this version, was while very old, was still alive, and he helped the people at the time kind of reorganize uh, it and put it back to a finished thing. But there are still things that are missing, which can lead to some confusing bits, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, a little bit later. But yeah, so incomplete, but we you do get the basics of the plot. Uh, right, and especially if you've watched the previous version. You know, you probably can fill in the blanks if you need to. Mm-hmm. So, um, like I mentioned, this is a much younger version of Sherlock and Watson. Uh, what was your uh, opinion initially of this version of Sherlock Holmes? Well, it was interesting because this one was one I've been looking forward to watching for a long time. Again, I thought I had watched it years and years ago, but I guess I'd really only seen the beginning of it, where he the, the scene we were talking about where he's writing stuff down. Which I did like because um, I would say the initial stuff before they do the leap forward in time, where you're seeing kind of the the University Sherlock and University Watson and all this stuff, I really enjoyed. And that's something that's not in the Gillette play; it's they added on. And pretty much once they do the flash forward, they they kind of morph into the Gillette play. But I really enjoyed the stuff before the flashback and like the stuff under the tree. Like if you're a Sherlock Holmes nerd, the stuff that he's writing down, he writes has like like a list of his strengths and weaknesses, which I think is taken almost if not entirely verbatim from the original uh, Steady and Scarlet story where Watson is listing Holmes's. He's trying to figure out what Watson, what, <laughs> yeah. Holmes, what Holmes does for a living and he's writing down his, his uh, Sherlock's strengths and weaknesses. So that I loved his little almost Easter egg. And you get introduced to his level of deduction, which you see him use in a kind of early mystery uh, that he solves when he's in the university and stuff. So that stuff was all really fun for me. For me, I think it falls apart kind of when it does the flash forward. I don't. I think it does... The film does better for me when it's doing its own thing. When it morphs mm-hmm. into, into the Gillette stuff, it doesn't do it as well. It just, for some reason, it felt like maybe it's because there's certain footage that is missing, but it felt like it was missing, I guess, some of the bite of that Gillette version. And it just felt kind of the kind of tame, almost boring version of that story. I'm glad I'm not alone because I also felt like this one was lacking a little bit. I really enjoyed John Barrymore. I liked, uh, this is probably my favorite Watson for sure. <laughs> and I even really liked Alice, but um, yeah, the, the story itself, maybe it was partly because I had just watched the original, but also because it felt like it was unnecessarily long in certain parts. And then the parts that I wanted them to spend more time on, there wasn't as much. Like a lot of the stuff with Moriarty felt like it was a little bit cut short. So maybe that is some of the missing footage and we would have had more there. Mm. But that sense of danger that I felt in the previous movie is not here. It's well, just not. Yeah, and it's, and again, it's, like we keep saying, it might partially be due to the missing footage, but some stuff just feels like it's not set up properly. Like, there's two moments that are in the Gillette version and are in this one, where at one point Sherlock, I think, is talking to Moriarty in his flat, and the page in the Gillette version, you see him getting attacked and he's beaten up, and eventually he goes up to Sherlock and they have a little discussion, whatever. In the Barrymore version, uh, you know, Barrymore talks to Moriarty, blah, 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 blah. And then Billy, just in the background, you see him, he's like in the entryway. He's just all beaten up, but you don't see him having right. had any sort of tussle. So it's very confusing, which I'm sure that was part of missing footage. I would hope it was anyway, because otherwise it's very confusing about what was going on. Or then there's another thing, which I'm not sure if it was something that was cut. It was just seems maybe it was something that just wasn't set up properly, where... I can't remember the exact context of the John Barrymore version, but in the William Gillette version, uh, Sherlock is cornered in a little warehouse thing. I think with the leading lady of that movie, he's he's cornered by some of Moriarty's goons, and the lights go out, and they think they know where Sherlock is because of his lit cigarette. And it turns out that he wasn't actually there. Sherlock just put the cigarette up on a window ledge or something, and that's where and, and he escaped while they were heading towards that light or whatever. But then in the Barrymore version... They have that, but they don't actually set up. They just, like, find a cigarette there. And, like, oh, I guess he wasn't actually here or something. And it's like, well, you didn't set up the cigarette thing, though. So right. It just, so it's a certain stuff that isn't really set up properly, and it just becomes confusing, which, again, I don't know if some of it was missing footage and, or some of it was just incompetence by the person who adapted it. So it just, 
you know, stuff is just missing. It can be confusing and just unsatisfying. Nonetheless, I'm not saying it's a bad version, but it was probably my least favorite of the four. Um, I mean, for me, it was probably the dullest of the four. I think, again, it's more Sherlocky than the first one we talked about. But, right. um, but yeah, again, it's confusing. And, again, stuff is, I think, intentionally in some cases cut out and uh, stuff. And uh, doesn't do as many interesting stuff with its source material. But um, how did you like the Moriarty in this one? Going back to the, uh, the silent movie bad guy makeup, it really it <laughs> makes it obvious yeah. who the bad guy yeah. is. <laughs> For sure, this was a step backwards. Like the 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 Moriarty in the previous movie, I wrote down in my notes that he basically kind of looks like an old Brando, and this one he definitely looks like a silent movie villain. Like you can tell from the first go, he has that you know weird bushy hair and the big, big eyebrows. eyebrows. And yeah. so yeah, I think it was a little bit of a step backwards. He's still you know he's still a fun villain to watch, and I'm not going to fault him for that. But I will say. Him being a weaker villain is why this is a weaker movie, because I think this is the best John Watson, and it's probably my, I don't know if this is my favorite or second favorite Sherlock, but in any case, yeah, I just didn't feel like it came together as well. They didn't play off of each other as well. It just felt a little bit more forced to me, Mm -hmm. but I really did enjoy seeing Barrymore, and I would love to, you know, get to know more of his performances, because... I think this may be the first John Barrymore movie I've seen. So. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Hey, I'll he, have to check more of those out for sure. Yeah, I think this was shortly before he did his uh, famous role as Hamlet, which people got a lot of praise for. Right. It was like one of the best, I think maybe even still maybe one of the best Hamlets. I think this is the only time he did Sherlock Holmes, much like, um, cause I think um, Gillette only did the one film. He played him on stage multiple times. The guy in the first town did it multiple t- a few times, but Barrymore only did it once. And the guy who in the next one only did it once. So um, it's a bit sad we didn't maybe get to see more of him and maybe more original stories that aren't based off the Gillette thing. It might have been nice for him to develop that uh, character a little bit more. I don't know how much of Roland Young you've seen or William Powell you've seen, but how did you like them in this uh, movie? I mean, William Powell, well, I'd say he's really young. I think he was like 30 or something, but he's very kind of, he looks like a baby in this movie. Uh, he t- looks like a baby in this movie i love him in general because i absolutely love the thin man love 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 my man godfrey you know he's just one of those iconic actors and i have multiple box sets of his work so i was very excited to see his first movie and it's not a giant part but Mm -hmm. it still was super fun to see him it's a significant one though yeah yeah very significant for sure and wells i do find it odd though this is very weird because this it, his character is not in well, he's sort of in the Gillette version though they expand it and add some subplots to it. He basically plays the butler from the orig- the, the Gillette one though he's in the Flash uh, and the in the origin part of it when they're at university. Sherlock invol- uh, solves a mystery involving William Powell's character, um, and then later it's very obvious that at that point William Powell has become kind of a confidant helper Sherlock regular guy but they don't it's weird because the movie doesn't really reference him as that character until that he was the character from the beginning until the end of the movie though he obviously is right they just don't really explain they oh they maybe i'm just reading wrong but it almost acts like you're supposed to be surprised that it's him or something right but it's like well obviously it's the same yeah so it's it's just very weird the way they set that up it's just i don't know it's just i don't know if again if it's a missing footage problem or if it was just a writing hiccup where they just didn't realize they hadn't set up the character properly for the flash forward. It was mm. just, yeah, it was very just odd to me, but yeah, then uh, Will and young gets a bit more to do as Watson, which was nice. Uh, I think Watson is steadily getting more and more to do in each one of these. Again, not tons to do. Uh, and, and the relationship between him and Holmes is not as fleshed out as I would want, but um, still, I think a uh, faithful, just underused uh, Watson. Yeah, it was still fun to see him, and also just seeing, you know, Sherlock and Watson kind of talk back and forth, and you know, Sherlock does some of his trademark Sherlock things of like figuring out all these clues about what Watson has done because various things about his person are different. So he's like, "Oh, I know you moved your nightstand. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Your wife isn't home, and all this other stuff." So I enjoyed him like picking those little things apart because that's one of the trademark things that that sherlock does to to watson yeah they have kind of a hilarious well i found a really funny deduction because at one point 
uh, they mentioned you know the stuff you mentioned. Then uh, one, one of the things he deduces is that uh, that Watson has moved his desk to another part of the room, his writing desk, and and he exp- Watson you know Sherlock explains all the other deductions, and Watson's like, well, how the hell do you know though that I moved my desk? And he's like, well, the before you had like something with something along the lines of, you know, you had a tan on this side of like the left side of you. Now it's on the right side of you. And you very well couldn't have moved the window, so you had to have moved the desk. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's just that was great. I mean, I that love stuff like that. I liked that a lot. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that make this worth pursuing, even if it's not the best overall movie. It probably has the most trademark Sherlock stuff in it. Mm-hmm. And it should be mentioned, uh, while the other all the other versions of Sherlock that we're talking about have were released by Flickr Alley, this one is was released by Kino Classics. Okay, so the last one we're going to talk about today is uh, also a v- adaption of The Hound of the Baskervilles. It is also German, as Rosalie hinted at uh, earlier in the podcast. The writer of the uh, first uh, Hound uh, adaption that we talked about was the director of this one, uh, Richard uh, Oswald. And this one uh, is, thankfully, a much more faithful adaption of the Hound uh, story. So again, Henry Baskerville's father has died. Uh, Henry then goes to inherit the estate. Uh, falls uh, in love with a woman. Um, the the this time is the sister of uh, she, her name is Beryl. Uh, I think sister or stepsister of of a butterfly collector slash scientist named Stapleton. But again, this kind of ominous spectral hound is kind of haunting uh, and endangering uh, Henry's life. Uh, so so uh, Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Kind of. Um, he is too busy in doing some other stuff in London, so he sends uh, Watson ahead to kind of watch over Henry and send him daily reports. This version, we should say right off, uh, again, was discovered fairly recently. It was also lost for a very long time. And Flickr I released this um, with the other version of The Hound we talked about. This is the main feature, the other version as kind of a bonus feature. While that version was, I believe, complete, this main version from 1929, which was the I believe the last uh, silent Sherlock Holmes movie ever made is sadly incomplete I think it's missing while well, they released it it's missing I think like maybe 20 or so minutes from around the middle of the film from when Watson leaves for Basketball Hall to a certain point after that so there is a good chunk of it missing so it's only around 65 minutes as opposed to probably the complete version was more, probably, I think, an hour and a half. What did you think of this one, uh, Rosalie? So I really liked it because it was more faithful to the book for sure. Mm-hmm. It also featured a more more believable interaction between Sherlock and Watson and a more substantial one. Mm-hmm. And I liked that Watson had a lot more to do. I also feel still that the hound was not that scary in this no. movie. <laughs> That's a problem with both of them. <laughs> I still quite enjoyed it. And I also felt like the uh, women in this movie, particularly the woman who plays Beryl, Betty Bird is her name, were much more interesting and well fleshed out than in some of the previous movies. So I would say probably besides Sherlock and Watson, my favorite character is Beryl. She's just more interesting. Yeah, there. Um, uh, this should be said, the cast of this film is not just German actors. They have a mix of American actors and some German actors. I think maybe even some French or Italian actors or something like that. Mm-hmm. One thing I liked about this one right away is that while I complained about the there being almost no mood of gothic or horror in the other adaption, this one starts off straight away with establishing uh, a great uh, mood to it with some great light and shadow, I think maybe some German expressionism type things and um, all sorts of great stuff. And, you know, it's a stormy night and they really establish a great uh, feel for it right away. Yeah, for sure. I wrote down German Expressionism in my notes, too, because I really like the way that, you know, the cinematography looks. And it's done by Frederick Vogelsang. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Uh, He was a Danish cinematographer who worked, you know, largely in Germany. But, yeah, his work was phenomenal on this. I loved the way that this movie was lit and the use of shadow. 
there's also some ominous, you know, sort of uh, swampy scenes, which, you know, I'm sure they didn't shoot in a real swamp, but they managed to make it look fairly mm. believable, which I was impressed by. And I think the mood, while, the, again, the Hound is not really scary at all in and of himself, I think the mood of the rest of it and the atmosphere they create with it, and just in terms of the what the actors are doing and them being scared some of the time and stuff, they make up for, I think, the Hound being not particularly frightening. And I think it takes a little bit longer. They still tip their hand a little bit early in this movie. Yeah. Might, but it takes a little bit longer before you fully know what what all is happening. And I still like the way that it ends up playing out. It had a much more satisfying resolution than the previous one. How did you feel about, again, I mentioned that some of this is missing, and uh, it should be noted while in the Sherlock Holmes with John Barrymore, the footage is just not there. In this one, because of what is lost and how much of it is lost, Flickr Alley has used production photos and just some bits of the original script to explain the gap of what's going on. So you kind of can follow it. It's not just a big chunk is missing. They do try to, they do kind of fill the gap in with pictures and, and text and stuff. Um, but how did you feel about that footage uh, being missing? Did you think it hurt the film at all? Well, of course I would have loved to see the complete film, but I felt like that was a good decision to, to on a uh, flicker alley's part to put that in because had I not been familiar with the story already, which, you know, I, having read the book and everything I was, I would have been a little bit lost probably as a viewer if they, if they hadn't done that. So I was grateful that they, Put it in and I thought it made sense that they used some photos to sort of fill in those gaps and it ended up just kind of feeling like longer intertitles so not too distracting obviously it would have been nice to spend a little bit more time in those scenes and with those people and maybe establish some more character stuff but it didn't detract from it too much for me I think for me the big and the second time around wasn't as big of a deal but I think it was still uh, bothered me a little bit the, I think the biggest thing that it hurts beyond maybe establishing more mood and stuff like that is that most of the establishing of the romantic relationship between Beryl and Henry happens in that missing footage where they first right. meet each other and they first start falling in love and stuff. So that does hurt the romance, which is a big part of the novel and most adaptions of this and stuff. So I think it does hurt that whole stuff because you don't really get to see them the establishing of any of it that is kind of in love by the time you get back to the actual... Uh, footage. So I think that's what's hurt the most is the romance subplot. That's fair. I will say that in many older movies, it seems like people fall in love in about two seconds and get yes. married the next hour. So yes. I was too put off by that because I'm used to seeing that in older movies anyway. I think for me, again, mood is great. Uh, much more faithful adaption stuff. Watson gets the proper screen time that he is supposed to get because again, for, I don't know, probably at least a third of the story or more of the original novel, uh, Sherlock Holmes is absent. So you really have to, so Watson gets the most to do than he probably does in maybe possibly any Sherlock Holmes story. But for me, I don't know, I felt like the biggest issue I had with this movie was that I feel like the Holmes and Watson of this are just very underwhelming. And they don't, for me, they don't really establish themselves very well as Sherlock and Watson. Well, we do at least get introduced to Sherlock while he's playing the violin. So I will give it that. Yes. Definitely um, establishing shot there. And, you know, he's he's wearing like a plaid outfit, although I think it is a robe. But he's he's smiling and he seems a little goofy. They both seem a little goofy. Like, honestly, they almost come across as like stoners. And the guy <laughs> who plays Watson, I felt like at times I was reminded of Jack Black. So... Oh, that, um, oh, that would be interesting. Uh, he, yeah, Watson is more comic in this, yeah. Yeah, I mean, not a problem, but it definitely is different from what I'm used to. And, I don't know, part of me felt like, because, again, I think this is the only time that either of these actors played Sherlock and Watson, part of me felt like, well, you know, was this their first one? They didn't really get to do more, and especially for Sherlock, he's missing for so much of it that he doesn't really have tons of time to establish much. But then again, like, the the first outing for Baz Rathbone and Nigel Bruce was the Hound of the Baskervilles, and they established themselves wonderfully so i don't know it's for me i it's just having the two central people for me being a bit weak kind of hurt it yeah i I enjoyed watson here but he definitely is less convincing as like a you know a great doctor who's worked you know in the war and things like that he he doesn't come across as somebody very serious uh i did enjoy though some of the comic moments like when he's creeping around at night and comes across the real source of the noises that he's been hearing, that was very entertaining. No, there's some nice stuff. And then at one point, the villain of the piece tricks 
uh, him into Watson to thinking that he's gotten a message from Sherlock and that, oh, he should go arrest this person and blah, blah, blah. Then, you know, uh, later Sherlock is like, well, obviously this wasn't me. This is even my handwriting, Watson. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much Watson, you dolt, you know, kind of yeah. thing or whatever. So that, yeah, is played a bit more for laughs and stuff. But, you know, that I didn't mind as much. I mean, uh, Nigel Bruce, I mean, one of the re- ways they gave him more to do was making him comic and a comic relief character and stuff. So that I don't really have an issue with. And they don't bungle it. I mean, if they had done really bad comic relief stuff with it, especially if they made him just so almost Homer Simpson moronic that he couldn't do anything, then that would have been more annoying. But he's intelligent enough, and the the, the humor they do with him, I think, is executed well enough that um, I don't mind it. I also really enjoyed some of the... There were a few throwbacks to the original one, right? Because there is the eyes behind the armor. Yeah. In this one again, and there's an you know an underground lair, but at the same time, there's a lot of new stuff that wasn't in the previous. And one of the things that I was surprised by because I wasn't really thinking about it in you know the timeline is that they're using phones now in this one, and yeah. they have cars. And so I was like, oh, this is like modern Sherlock in a way. Um, yeah. Well, again, like, they, again, no real attempt to set it in modern times. So right. Or or, or Victorian times rather. Yeah. No, it, it was it was very modern, but um, felt very faithful to the novel, really. And I loved the way that it wrapped things up at the end. I don't want to give it away because I think this one has the best ending. No, it does, and it is more. Again, it's if you know the the Baskerville story, the 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 original Doyle novel, this one I think would be much more satisfying and stuff. It does follow up pretty closely. It does change certain things and omit certain things and stuff, but um, that's fine. It's an adaption. It can do that. Okay, so um, before we start wrapping things up, Rosalie, um, I guess, how do you feel, at least in the ones we've seen, obviously there's many more other Silent <laughs> Sherlock's, there's the Ely Norwood films, which I talked about, which were much more adapting, direct adapting Doyle stories and blah, blah, blah. Um, out of the ones we've watched, uh, how do you feel uh, Sherlock has kind of translated into the silent uh, medium? Because he is a character who is very dialogue-reliant, uh, uh, in terms of novels and in most adaptions, so it can maybe be tricky to adapt him, and he is maybe made more of an action hero on a lot of these than he is in the story, so how do you feel like he, he translated to the silent uh, 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 films? I would say just okay, right? And I completely agree with you on the reason, because I was thinking the same thing. The, the book version of Sherlock is witty, he has a lot to say, He's, you know, there's a lot of, like, fun wordplay at times or just at least explanations that just doesn't come across the same way when you're reading it on the screen and seeing the characters, you know, talking, but you're not not really hearing them. So it was a little bit tough to adapt that in Silent Era, I would say. It was fun, though, to see all these different kind of visions of Sherlock because this was almost contemporary with, you know, Conan Doyle. I mean, the... I think The Hound of the Baskervilles was published in, like, 1902 or something like that. And so people had probably read the book within their lifetime because it had just come out, and then, you know, they're seeing film adaptations of it. So I have to wonder what people's reaction was back then who had read the books and were like, oh, now we get to see it. You know, movies were so new at the time that I guess it was probably exciting, but looking back on it, not quite as impressive. Yeah, and uh, and it's also noted Doyle was still alive for all of these. He died in 1930, so he did live to see all of these. His last, I mean, hell, the last Sherlock Holmes story um, was 1925, so up until the last one of these, they were still being written. So it was still a very current thing and stuff. But yeah, not none of these films, I would say, are great, which I guess leads me into my other question, which would be your favorites of, of, of these ones? That's tough. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to say two answers. My favorite Sherlock of all of them would probably be John Barrymore. But my favorite of the movies would be the 1916 William Gillette version. Because I I still feel like that's the one that ha- that captures the best in terms of the spirit of Sherlock and still mm-hmm. having that sense of danger. But, you know, managing to get in some of his little trickery. So I think that one, that mm-hmm. second one my favorite what about you um i think well a similar ish answer i think gillette is probably my favorite of the Holmeses, and his is probably the my favorite of the movies i think i might like the hound more because for me that's probably the most accurate maybe because that's directing and it, it's d- directly adapting one of the novels and stuff and it does great with the mood and all that stuff um i think that's more in tone with 
the Doyle stuff. I think sometimes the somebody I didn't mention sometimes the Gillette one does kind of almost feel more like a gangster movie with Sherlock Holmes in it. So yeah, I would say Gillette favorite Holmes, and then that his film. I think it's just the best one of the bunch, and again, is a nice time capsule of of a stage Sherlock, and it just was just again just very interesting to watch. So. Yeah, that would be my favorite. Did any of of these? Did your rankings or of, of Sherlock's uh, change after this significantly? Like, did any of them become your favorite or close to it? No. Again, it's hard without that verbal like wordplay stuff going on. So I would still have to say my favorite is Benedict Cumberbatch. But you have definitely convinced me that I need to go back and visit other Sherlock's on screen. Oh, you do. I, oh my God, I just oh. <laughs> God, just the fact that you haven't seen Brett or Rathbone, it just it pains me so much. I They're know. So go- oh, Rathbone. Oh, he's not, oh not, well, Rathbone's good too, but uh, uh, Brett is so good. I can't even describe to you. But anyway, um, I just expect a daily report. But um, okay, well, I have a lot to look forward to at that. Point. Yes, yes. So um, I would definitely say even the 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 first hound we checked we talked about, even though I really uh, hated. <laughs> watching it um i would say check all of them out i think they're all interesting for one reason or another and they're all worth seeing um if you're a sherlock fan even if some of them maybe feel a bit off uh in terms of the original canon um but yeah definitely check them out and then definitely check out the gillette one it is a very important piece of sherlock holmes history especially the uh movie history and stage history so it is definitely something that uh, should be checked out i really got back into it like that like i had been when i first discovered holmes so if anything the best thing that came out of this was a rediscovery of my love of sherlock so now it's time to talk about some upcoming blu-ray releases that we're excited about and hope to get our hot little hands on and i'm going to start out with Two from Kino. So the first one is a movie that I have loved for a very long time. It's Clay Pigeons, which stars uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Vince Vaughn. And it's a 90s movie, so it's not like a throwback the way these are, obviously. (laughs) But uh, it's a movie that's near and dear to my heart, and it's finally getting a proper treatment. So that will be coming out on Kino on July 27th. There's another one coming from Kino that I've never seen. But it's from a filmmaker who is legendary for, you know, a film called Possession. If anybody out there is familiar with this crazy movie called Possession by Andre Zdulowski, I'm sure I'm perhaps butchering his name. But in any case, he has another movie coming out on Kino that was released originally in 1985. The English version is called Mad Love and the French version is L'Amour Brock. And this movie stars a number of interesting folks. Sophie Marceau, Francis Huster, uh, Chucky Cario. And um, it just looks like a really interesting movie. And it's also supposed to be a postmodern homage to Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot. But it's set in like a gangster world. So I'm just super intrigued by it. It looks very interesting. And um, his movie that I have seen possession is one of the most insane things I've ever watched. So I'm super curious about that. And then I'll jump over to arrow for a second. So arrow has several things coming out on June 29th that I'm very excited about. One of them is the Dario Argento movie, the bird with the crystal plumage. And this is getting the 4k treatment. It's looking gorgeous. I love this movie. I love the Dario Argento giallos that I've seen. And this is one of my favorites. I would have to say, So that one looks great. And then another Italian release is coming out, and that's called Years of Lead, five classic Italian crime thrillers from 1973 to 1977. And I haven't seen any of these movies. I wouldn't begin to tell you how they are pronounced, but they look fascinating. I love a good crime movie, and I think Italian cinema is something that every time I dip my toes in, I'm really into it. It's you know, got a whole, I mean, it's, it's its own thing. If you ever, you know, if you watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know a little bit about it because Quentin threw in a lot of homages there. But yeah, I'm very interested in this one. And then finally, I'll close out with my Criterion picks. So I believe since the last time we talked, they made this announcement. One of the ones that's been on my, remember how I told you, I have a Criterion spreadsheet of like, <laughs> I own the ones I want to own and the ones that Criterion needs to get on releasing. One of those is coming out on June 29th, and that is Pariah, 
by D. Reese, and I am super excited about that one. And then a film noir that I love that I've owned on DVD and I now am excited to own on Blu-ray, and that is Pick Up on South Street by Samuel Fuller. So that is my wish list. I will turn it over to you. Okay, I don't have a lot to say about this section. I will say um, something I think that was recently-ish, I think very fairly recently released, from Warner Archive was a uh, restored version of Dr. X, uh, which is a horror film, which uh, I totally forgot they released, or I would have bought it recently, and I'll get to that in a second. But from what I've seen of it, and what I've heard from people talking about recently, apparently it's just a gorgeous restored version of that. And uh, speaking of Warner Archive and buying things, recently-ish, Warner Archive announced that it was closing down its shop, it is now has a shop specifically with Amazon. Uh, they have a specific uh, location where you can find their films and stuff. How did you feel about um, about it moving to Amazon? Because I was very kind of unhappy about that decision because I try to avoid Amazon these days, and the fact that you know a label that I want to support and give money to is now uh, you know is so directly linked to a company that I do not like to support. I don't know. It's left me kind of between a rock and a hard place with that. But I don't know if you had any opinions on that. Yeah, I mean, it makes me sad, right? It feels like the end of an era because I just have many memories of scrolling through page after page after page of the Warner Archive. And even though it was like looking through, you know, the Sears Roebuck catalog before Christmas to like pick out the presents I'm not going to get, it was still really fun. And of course, every time they did want to have one of those four for 44 sales, I would quite often like load up my cart and buy stuff and it was something that I looked forward to like a little kid on Christmas. I just, I am going to miss that. I don't know the, you know, the future for Warner archive. I don't know if this means that they're not going to make new movies. Well, or um, they at least differently. Well, they have, I mean, they're selling stuff through Amazon uh, for the media future. They still have some releases that they need to release. So they're definitely doing those. And it looks like they are still going to be making stuff. They're just not going to be selling them through the WB uh, shop. Yeah. So it looks like they're still there. They're still there. I think we can still look forward to them making things. They have not said they're going away. They're just changing how they're selling their stuff. Um, but it's disappointing, I guess, is how where they're selling it, I suppose. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it's probably for survival, right? Yeah. And, you know, this may happen more in the future. So at the moment, it's a bummer, but I also feel like at least we can still access them. And I hope that we continue to do so. But, yeah, it's always sad when a, a company like that closes its doors. I'm sure there were people that worked there that no mm-hmm. longer do. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, thoughts to those folks. You guys are awesome. And I hope you land somewhere else that will mm-hmm. give you gainful employment. I do think people who want alternatives, I have heard um, that you can still, you should still be able to get, if you do not want to give money to Amazon, but you want to give money to Warner Archive, um, I think you could still get stuff through I think Target and uh, a place called Deep Discount, and I think there's one other place I can't remember what it's uh, called that you could still, you should still be able to get. I think even new Warner Archive releases from. So if you want to still support the label, uh, maybe look through those if you don't want to go through Amazon. Okay, so uh, we're getting close to wrapping up, but we did want to preview uh, what we're going to have coming up in the next few months. Uh, next month in May, uh, we're going to be talking about two Al- Albert Brooks movies, uh, Lost in America and Defending Your Life. Um, as you remember, I recently got Lost in America. Um, really excited to dive into that and Defending Your Life. I know Rosalie's a big fan of the, both of those um, and Albert Brooks in general. And then in June, uh, we're tentatively hoping to do uh, hopefully the first of many LGBT months. Uh, we'll be talking uh, this this year, hopefully, about uh, some lesbian films. Um, that is dependent on a guest. Uh, we're working on getting somebody for that. But again, tentatively scheduled for June. Like in previous times, we've had things like this. If we can't get a guest, we'll change the topic to... We're going to change the topic to something else, uh, which we'll let you know about as soon as we can, if that problem should come up. Then in July, something I think we're both excited about, for more reasons than one, uh, we're going to be talking about a Criterion released, oh, the past couple years, year or two, or whatever. They released a Bruce Lee collection, which uh, has... Uh, some uh, of his most famous films in them, maybe all of them. Uh, just a list of, oh, I don't know, four or five, whatever it is, films, um, which I, I haven't seen any of. So I'm very excited to uh, dive into that. And uh, there's also another reason, because we're going to have a special guest for that episode, aren't we, Rosalie? Yes, we are. I have a in-house expert on Bruce Lee who is going to be joining us. So uh, stay tuned for that. Very excited. It's her dog. 
Is this gonna burn? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so yeah, those are the things we're going to be talking about uh, over the next uh, few months, uh, hopefully. But um, until then, uh, you can check out um, our parent company's Twitter account at 25YL site. And you can check out my Twitter account where you can see links to my YouTube channel at, uh, at Cinema Pack Rat. And I'm at Rosalie Lewis. And um, until next time, uh, we are going to catch you guys later.